So I appreciate everyone coming this afternoon. Um, welcome, my name is Heather Otto and I'm the curator for Native American and Non-Western Art here. And I am so very, very honored. Not only do we have um, our guest speaker, our guest artist, um, she's here as the, I'm gonna butcher this, but she's here as the Westheimer Distinguished Visiting Artist. And um, that's a huge thing if you're not familiar. This is a, a position that has been filled um, every other year with the School of Art. It gives our students an opportunity to work with a professional working artist of a, a national, international status. And we certainly can um, include Christine in that. But I also want to recognize that I'm not going to name everybody because I'm sure I'm going to butcher it up. But we have some esteemed guests in the um, audience. And I just want to extend to each of you so much appreciation for coming. And um, to everybody, thank you so much for making time today. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Christine McCourse, who will um, visit in the gallery with her exhibition, Dark Light, the Micaceous Ceramics of Christine of Chissy McCourse. You, you're going to have to tell me if this is too loud or it's OK. Because um, I feel like I have a frog in my throat. <laughs> anyway. Um, Thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm very happy to be here myself, and the, this uh, experience is uh, brand new for me. I, I'm getting so much attention now that I don't even know what to say. But uh, I want you guys to know that I'm open to, open to any question at all. And uh, this is the first time I'm, I'm, I'm seeing this setup in this in here uh, as well. So we'll just, I guess, um, if um, if you want me to speak to my sketches. I'll start over here. Some of these pieces, some of the sketches are within the, the uh, gallery, but uh, some of them are also uh, older pieces. Uh, I've worked myself up to the point where I'm working from, from the office sketches um, in the years, uh, say, before when I first started doing pottery, my pieces were more traditional uh, in terms of uh, I was, I was using uh, the micaceous clay from Taos Pueblo, where my uh, husband's grandmother uh, lived and owned a little curio shop. And uh, when I married my husband, uh, uh, we supplemented, uh, made our income from her little shop. And at that point in time, my husband and I had been, had, uh, had uh, uh, we were jewelers as well, and so we were selling little pieces of jewelry and little curio type turtles and, and bowls and, and owls and little figurative type things. Anyway, um, we, the last hour began. Uh, his um, grandmother, Lena Archuleta, who I credit with teaching me uh, her traditional ways of processing my clay and gathering my clay, um, uh, introduced me to their family clay pit. Um, um, she just taught me the basics and from that point on, my pieces even if eventually got a little bit bigger, a little stronger, a little more complicated. And uh, it's been a good uh, 43 years uh, trip to get to this point here where I'm at now. My, my pieces are so huge now that I, I probably average about four pieces a year. Um, the, the last piece that, uh, that I, that I uh, have been working on is, is this piece here. And that's the actual size of it. It barely fits into a kiln, which, I, which is what I use these days. Because my, my pieces are a little bit more complicated in, in the construction, that I don't risk them to outdoor firings anymore, unless, I, unless they're, they have a, a simple enough shape that I, that I can control most of the elements around it, like a, give it a proper wind rake. Do it, you know. And I have the enough time so that I can, I can um, attempt, uh, give it that as much time as it needs. But um, there's a lot of preheating that needs to be done um, to drive the water out of this clay and bring it to a point where, where it, it will survive the, out, the, the fire. <coughs> um, the hardest things that I'm talking about are I've learned through trial and error. It's not um, I don't have the formal training that most people. Uh, going, going to an art institution. Uh, when I was at, at the Santa Fe Indian Art Institute, I was 14 years old and I left when I was 18. So I basically was there to to go through high school. And I had uh, 
uh, had great instructors. So Alan Hauser, uh, Ralph Partington was my instructor for ceramics. Um, uh, Charles Lolema, uh, he was my jeweler instructor, and many others who were very young at that point in time and, and wonderful uh, uh, artists. And uh, I'll have all, a lot of my peers are amazing. Uh, uh, I see them today, and there are uh, many successful uh, artists coming from the same uh, time that I that I was there at the school. But um, anyway, this is how I've kind of arrived to this point, and um, uh, my uh, what I guess one of the main things that, that I look at today is, uh, like I said, that now I'm um, creating my pieces from actual sketches. And this is a kind of a, it, you'll find this one in this, in this uh, exhibit, I believe. But this is funny because I went to a movie one day and I, and I saw, I think it was an uh, avatar. And they had this floral things and I said, well, I'm glad I made my piece before I saw that movie. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have felt kind of weird about it. But um, I have a lot of fun just uh, uh, creating uh, walls off of a single wall, and these are like little collars that that uh, cut this this um, thing <laughs> spiral. But um, so if again, if you these are this one, the, these sketches here are basically from uh, my um, earlier years. You can see they're more based on more of uh, the waterboard type of shapes storage jar type of shapes, the uh, wedding vase, which is, I don't consider to be, it might be an ancient shape, but the terminology, I think, has just been kind of put on there. Uh, but who knows? Um, um, let's see. Uh, the, this piece here was actually a sketch that, uh, of five that I was, I was making for uh, a person who, a collector of teapots. And so I sketched about five different ones and managed to make this one uh, uh, and maybe two others. But um, it's supposed to, it's actually usable. It kind of, if you try to go, like drive the liquid through the handle, it's not going to work. But what happens is it's a, the spout comes right down in here and this handle just attaches to that spout. But visually, it looks as if it's impossible. And the lid is actually like saddled to fit around the contour of that handle. So it's, it's, it's kind of, I guess um, I'm trying to create a uh, standard uh, 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 functional pieces that, uh, I mean, this clay is so fantastic. It's, uh, it, it's uh, uh, the uh, origins are, are uh, cookware. And this type of clay, because of the mica that's in the, in the in, that it's derived from, and not just introduced into a clay clay base, um, because it's derived from mica, it's got this high thermal shock value that allows you to cook in it, and it takes a repeat repeated uh, heating and cooling, and uh, these uh, uh, bean pots or whatever type of pot cooking pots can actually last for generations and generations. And, um, but, uh, so, um, gotten to the point where um, my pieces, like I said, are becoming more and more complex. This, this piece here actually has a double wall on the, on the right, two thirds of it, and a single wall on the front of it. And this piece is, um, belongs to Milwaukee Pueblo. It's, uh, it, uh, um, they, uh, the governor, George Rivera, commissioned me to make this piece. And it's, it's basically a pot sitting in the fire. So it's a combination of the, those two elements um, in this design. And the reason I open up the outer walls is so that my inner wall can dry and can uh, survive all that stress of the drying and, 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 and uh, it adds another element of design as well. Um, this one here, um, I, I made kind of 
hastily, and you'll see it, I think, in the center part of this uh, exhibit. I could see it from the outside, outside that window. So it's got a slightly different shape, but it's the same idea of, a, of building a pot and then cutting out, just take away the, the, the negative, leaving negative space. So, um, and I made it quickly for a, a, an auction piece because I have grandkids who are going to a, 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 a school in Santa Fe that's that I try to support in any way I can for their uh, their little scholarships and stuff. Uh, and uh, anyway, I sold there, and it's in the show here now, which is nice <laughs> because it gives a, another another side of the. Uh, uh, gave me another. It gave me a chance to do something different than what I, I, I have done before. And I like to do that occasionally, is to take a challenge from someone to do, maybe be part of a, a, a mask a show that um, is um, uh, based on masks, uh, like say maybe around Mardi Gras or something like that. Because it makes me, it pushes me out to do something different. And which is good, it's refreshing. Um, these pieces, uh, I, some, sometimes I like to make people think about them. They, they see it and, and, it, and it, it actually uh, appeals to, their, to, to a certain sense, visually. But usually most of my pieces that I make, I make them so that I built them hand-coiled and uh, maintain a, a certain thickness so so that people can actually lift them and you can feel the balance and the weight of it. It's not like uh, too heavy on one side or anything. And it's not only that, you don't want it to tilt over and not be knocked over very easily. But um, so a lot of, uh, for me, it's, uh, the, the pleasure isn't just visual, it's, it's tactile as well. And, um, um, and what, which has actually led me through many, many different techniques of firing or finishing, like maybe applying a, a, a sap, a resin that I had boiled down, which is what the Navajos do to uh, waterproof their baskets and their pottery. Um, and uh, but it's led me to explore like um, uh, techniques like uh, scraffito where when I put the pitch on top of a fire pot that's been etched or incised, when the, when the sap goes into the lines, it will darken. And I get a hairline, a deep black hairline. Uh, and I use that to incise uh, things like uh, basket designs. So I have many, many other, tried many, many other um, elements of design. But, um, uh, let's see getting off track here. But um, if there are any questions, just speak up. But um, this, this piece here is the first time I did uh, something more sculptural uh, that could, um, I don't know how to explain it. It's, um, it's, it, it's a three piece, it's not just a single piece. And um, if you notice, I left the, uh, the natural colors to to by by doing a reduction firing, where or in the absence of oxygen, these pieces are now turning black. But it's the same clay. And um, um, let's see. Anyway, so um, I'm also doing uh, when I did the, uh, to kind of tie these three pieces together. You notice I have I have lines that will that will flow from one piece up through the other one and uh, around and back through the other one and and then around and then it'll fall right back through. So they're kind of tied together by this little this little lines that you don't even see really, but just based on the shape. Um, I think that's most of the ones that are in here. Um, a lot of uh, what I like to do, and I talked about this one already, but what I do also like to do is uh, is um, test the strength of my clay. And 
because of the mica flakes in there, I found that I can I get a just a great extension because when I when I uh, we wedge uh, the clay and uh, roll it out, it not only aligns the clay particles, it also aligns all the mica particles. So these mica particles are down there at the teeniest level of uh, uh, size and uh, because it's actually derived from that type of rock, my micaceous rock, and um, it's not just uh, mica that's been introduced into a local clay. This is uh, the real stuff. Are these hollow inside? They're very hollow. Um, when I start them at the base, I usually begin with a small patty or some kind of a patty. And I make sure that my fingers can reach to the center because from that point on, I maintain that same thinness or thickness, depending on the size of the piece, um, from the beginning all the way to the end. And usually, I start with a base, uh, like I said, a patty, add a coil all the way around, an even coil that, instead of just coiling them like this and scraping them together, I do a coil at a time. So I'm building maybe an inch or so every, because once I put that coil on, I can also pinch it up. So I usually get an inch at a time at each level. So if um, I'm not like making one piece and then I'm making another piece and then putting them together. These are, are well thought out to the point to where I, at every level I know the contour that I have to follow if, I, if, the, if the wall is going to go out or if it's going to come in or if it's going to be uh, reduced you know, to a smaller circle and then spread out again. I, I, it's just uh, as if water was rising. You can see the, you know, wherever you cut it, you can, you can see. In fact, I, in fact, sometimes I do have to make a maquette or a model of it first, and then cut it at certain points so I can see which direction my walls are going at what level. And um, but always maintaining the, the same thin, thinness with my coils. Um, these are basically uh, just a form. The form is what was the most important thing to me. Um, the other pieces like this one here, I have, a, if you can imagine the base of, the, of this uh, piece here, um, there is an actual uh, tunnel or a hole. It's almost as if it's, there's a donut. It's got that contour. And from the center of the bottom inside uh, begins a tube. And that tube just soaks or connects all these uh, outside compartments. Uh, and then uh, opens up and forms uh, the outside of, the, of this thing. So it's all connected. There are no, uh, there's no reason to to make any breathing holes or anything like that because what, where the air, if I shot air down into that, it would come out there and there, you know, it's open basically based on those, uh, uh, or the two threads there. And uh, I'm also starting to play a little bit with texture so you can see that just by applying a thicker slip and not burnishing it will give that texture of that little uh, globe. Are you building the two at the same time as you're yeah, I am. I am. I have to. And the reason I have to is because as much as I can, I like the control of the drying, to control the drying. And as, as and the same, um, for the same reason as to open up those outer walls to let the air get in there, I, I'm, um, I'm lifting these up and giving air space and putting it in a, on, on placing it on a rack that will allow the air to get up in there. But yes, as I'm building, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I can just interrupt very quick. Sure. Uh, security has asked me to just let you guys know, these things don't belong to the museum. Of course, if they did, we want the same care. But um, they are all here on loan. If you'll be very careful about getting close to the cases and also the wall, um, uh, they, they wanted me to stop and just mention that as we move through the gallery so just please do so very carefully thank you sorry sure um, let's see um, so um, in order to get that inner tube 
to shrink down uh, so that it doesn't shrink after the after the outside uh, chamber has dried. And it's all the timing so that one is not shrinking and hitting the other wall that hasn't that hasn't shrunk yet, or the one that has shrunk but the other one's shrinking. You know, it's it's all the, it's almost like orchestrating. But the tube isn't touching the vessel. Um, no, no, it's not touching the vessel. Um, is the mica? Is does the mica? Is it hard on your hands? Uh, you working with it? No. Really? No, it's not like little slivers of glass. Or no. Okay. No. Um, as you can see, I, I when I process my clay, um, I actually lose the larger mica particles. If you put blush on, it has mica in it. It's not. They're not going to give you anything. This is a slick. Your hands look good. Very. <laughs> well, you just see them in the winter time. That's when they really crack. But um, you know, usually I. I used to not work during the winter. It didn't make any sense to me. Do all my work in the spring and go through summer, get any market and that was it, and, and then take a break for the winter. But these days, it seems like I'm working through the, the whole year, which is different for me. Um, this piece here was one of my one of the first pieces that I that I started experimenting with uh, with a tube base running up through and just folding over and come in a shape that there's no uh, connection, again, around the uh, base and the uh, actual pot sheet thing. And it's very simple, it just like <laughs> And see, again, I'm testing, uh, you know, when I fire it, is it gonna get, is it gonna soften, is it gonna flop, or, you know, even as it's drying, is it gonna flop? So I, I, a lot of times, to in order to make it to make this pieces, I can flip it over. Once I hit that point, I can flip it over and, and uh, build this way. So do you have to let the clay dry to a certain point before it will start supporting yes. what you're hanging uh -huh. off of it? How it depends. Um, you know, when I work, I work slow and tediously. Uh, very, uh, it takes a lot of concentration. And so, so because I'm trying to maintain an even enough wall, an even enough wall, so that I don't do a lot of scraping or sanding afterwards. Right. It limits all that stuff I don't like to do. <laughs> and so, um, but um, uh, yeah, if you uh, let it gain enough strength, it didn't take very long. A little air drying or something, and then it, it, it can support. You know, you, you with through with experience, you can sense when it's ready to to go on to the next the stage. Next, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, I guess so. so. These are so beautiful. And my question is, at what? Um, I don't know. You can give me a year. Or just, I'm just interested in your thought process. Like, what? How you went from your earlier work um, to because it was a thought process to like start changing these into these more sculptural. Uh -huh. so what? What kind of led you there? Well. Um, when I first started making pottery, um, I was hitting the market for house style, figure style, the micaceous. Um, and finally, all the collectors in my area, they, they had a piece like that, am I right? Because they had purchased one, and then I thought, well, you know, Navajo as well, I should, I should learn how to do the, use the, the Navajo uh, stuff, and, and, and I introduced that into my pieces. and. Um, and then, I guess uh, a lot of times my incentive is to do something different because I get bored with doing the same old piece, which is what took me off of throwing on the wheel. I did. I learned it really quickly in high school, but then got bored real quick, so I I throw half the pot and take it off and start building, hand building, um, to make it asymmetrical because to me um, symmetry is boring, so I tend to get. Uh, off on this other track, so, but um, also, uh, but learning all of the tradition, traditional shapes, and even the, the gourd shape, uh, like the Anazazi gourd shaped pieces, they're, they're so organic and they're so beautiful, uh, 
um, like squashes and pumpkins and things like that. You know, it makes you want to try shapes like that. Um, because in nature you see all these uh, modifications and, and, and adaptations and all kinds of things. That, that, that. And so there's so much more to do than the same old thing. And so I guess I can, I can truthfully say that once I start feeling that boredom or something repetition or something, I need to do a modification or a combination and do something different. So, um, as I guess in a way, I can, if I wanted to pinpoint, uh, well, I've been, I've been kind of the whole spectrum of hand building, and then where do you go from there? Now that now that now I've filled up that market basically, and I've kind of gotten tired of it, so move into the contemporary, you know, aspect of it, and then and just, oh, I mean. It just, I mean, after a few trips to to Europe, it's like, uh, where's the work, you know? You just, it just opens up the world to you to, to see more, you know? And so, you know, for me, you don't even stop there. I mean, you've got the whole universe, you've got all nature to jump from. One thing I love about them, you can still see your beginnings, though, in the pottery mm -hmm. that, that has morphed into the sculpture. I like mm -hmm. seeing the pottery beginning. Yeah. Well, I, I, I obviously enjoy what I'm doing. Um, uh, I, if, if that, did I answer your question? I, sometimes I have a hard time staying on track. Um, this piece here, I made it to, to, to give, give an image of a, a floating ring because you can't see the support. On that, if you look at it, it's just like a, it's like a, a couple baby legs and the diaper runs over. <laughs> but if you look around, around it, you can't see any evidence of what's holding that link, that little ring up. So, but it is again the, one of the first two, two type of things that I that I made. Uh, this piece up here, uh, the higher piece, is a um, just basic. Uh, uh, storage uh, shape pot, and uh, I have I have this, the shoulders going in to create an inner inner tube. So it's not coming from the bottom; it's coming from the shoulder. Uh, and so there's an inner tube uh, neck that comes up. And then I and again at the same time I was building that I I started another wall um, a little bit further out from that that neck and then I started another wall a little bit further out from that. So there are three walls going on in there. And again, it was just a matter of opening, opening up the outer wall so that the inner ones can get dry air. You know? So um, I, I don't like to say, uh, this is one piece that I did not sketch. Uh, it was something that I was uh, pushing to see if uh, what would happen if I did, and then you, obviously you, you start to realize, okay, you have to open that up, <laughs> so that inner, and then I say, hey, you can see the actual pot inside, you know, follow the line inside and see a pot there, and everything else is like a, like an eruption. So that's why I named that thing Vesuvius. Vesuvius. Is that, is that too open on the pot? Yes. Yeah. It, uh, yeah, it goes all the way up. It goes all the way to the base. No, no, it's not that one. Okay. It's off the shoulder. Okay. Three walls off the shoulder. Mm -hmm. Um, this one here, if I can see something. It's kind of funny, but I, I've always okay. So I'm trying to make these vessels, right? I'm trying to call them, keep calling them structural, uh, sculptural vessels. And then occasionally you'll find a little pinhole because you have to have, you can't just build something that's totally enclosed. You have to have a, a little vent or air hole type of thing. And oh, there it is on this side. Almost looks like a mole like I have here, but it's on this side. But uh, it's, to me, that's, it's just like a, a period. You know, it's the end of the end. Of, that's the, where I chose to put that. But it fired very nicely and I was very happy with the shape. Do you still the lose, shape. lose items in the film? Uh-uh. 
I, I haven't I haven't lost one in a kiln at all, which is why I fire in a kiln because I don't subject them to outdoors. To, it's too risky. I can't control the the heat or the uh, the rate that the pot is heated up, you know. So, but in a kiln, I can't. The whole thing just. Do you use a cider when you get color? What's that again? Do you use a cider or? I don't. Okay, I guess cider. So you fire in the kiln, right? Yeah. Uh, when because you get I'm. Your uh, I what I do is uh, so, okay, fire to maybe like just below 1400 degrees. Look, I'm not like I said. I'm not like real familiar with cones and the temperatures and everything. Uh, but uh, fire to about 1400 degrees uh, Fahrenheit and then come down just a little bit and, so that we can lift it out of the kiln and uh, subject it into a canister. That, and I use newspapers, which um, so you have well, kind of, but it's not raccoon. Yeah, yeah, it's, so the, yeah but it's the, the, it, it's the uh, burning out of the yeah. oxygen and, yeah. and, and creating a, a vacuum yeah. with uh, putting the lid on. Mm -hmm. And it turns instantly black, yeah. which is uh, fun to watch if you can, because I've done it in smaller stainless steel for uh, pots with a tempered lid. And you can, it looks like a shadow's just gone over, you know, it's quick. Um, this piece here was, uh, I, I, I think it's the first time, one of the first pieces I started sketching because I didn't want to make the same shape uh, pot, but I wanted something different. So I was, I was trying to think of, okay, what if, uh, what if I had a, 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 a line, a visible line, on the outside edges of those coils and the, you know, you just have this air space. Uh, it's kind of difficult, it was very difficult to do as what I had sketched, but I managed to do that, so I was very happy with this one. Now, did you use your fingers totally, or did you use any tools when you were making the sharp edge? Um, both. Both? both yeah. So you do use tools in the various... Oh yeah, I, I use all kinds of tools. Okay. Some make sense and some are weird. <laughs> I mean, that's that's what you do. You have more tools than you need, actually. Yeah. If I if I um, if I uh, just get the basic tools, I end up with maybe that I need to work with maybe five six things. And that's about it. And I will also limit the amount of water that I use to you know. It's just another thing that I do. <laughs> Um, here's the piece that I was talking about with the, and you'll see that the, the vent holes for this one are right there in the center of the, mm -hmm. this design. There are two of them. Can they go all the way through the inner? So into the, yeah, that's about the point where the, the wall splits and divides. It becomes two on this side, and it's one on that side. And the person that, um, okay. Uh, commissioned me to do this with one of the uh, a, a little bit of the uh, melon gold frame shape on the front, so that's why I use one one uh, wall. But the coils are put, are hollow all the way to the point. Um, again, for me, it, it, if it was solid, it would give it more weight. You know, you just throw it off for me. Did you complete the first wall before you started the second one? No, the same thing as a go up, you know. Oh, okay. Uh, Both at the same time. Yes. So, so you would see the the, the round base, and then you would see uh, one wall on one side, and then you'd see the beginning of two walls. Uh, okay. And the openings are those created as you go up, or um, after? I oh, I, I I wait for it to get. Let it, you know, hard enough so that it doesn't distort what I cut. But I do have a beginning because I have to have that breathing, that, that air, mm -hmm. uh, and then just kind of refine them later, you know, and, and maybe add a little coil, a few coils to give it a little bit more definition or, or yeah. How do you tell that it's just right to cut into? Is it the look, the feel? It's the feel. It's the feel. Um, and plus, I know in, uh, instinctively or intuitively that that it's ready to be taken to the next level. Um, um, 
just through experience. Um, so you do most of your inside smoothing before you get the outer wall as tall? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, again, it's, it's, yeah. there's not room in there to do right. all these things or whatever. <laughs> so it's a little bit higher than the outer wall at all times? Uh, yes, yes, exactly. Because it's hard to get, yeah. you, you get in, back. yeah, you get in, you're, you're in way of yourself, kind of. Right. <laughs> this piece here was uh, fun to do because uh, uh, it, it, when you look at it, uh, I designed it so that if someone looked at it, they would have to figure out where the heck that hole goes to. And what it, where, what it does is it just goes right into that neck, and, but it comes out of this side of this spot. So um, I, I like making people <laughs> guess what's happening. <laughs> You obviously, there's a huge amount of, of consideration, planning, a lot of intellectual work that goes on. But is there some point where your hands just take over and you know the pattern you're going for? Or is it always primarily a um, mental focus thing? Mental focusing, lots, like I said, a lot of concentration. I, you know, I, I, I work at a, at a certain rate, and if there's anything that causes me to speed up or, or, or something's different with my clay, it throws me off. So, and then I have to bring it to the point where I can, like if my clay's too wet, you know, it drives me nuts. If it's too tacky, it drives me nuts. It has to be a certain amount of water in there. And then you can leave it overnight and go back to it. Oh yeah, some and of these pieces take me months. Well, that's what I'm thinking, so it's, <coughs> So the amount of moisture you put back into it in the morning or whatever. I oh, I'm, not putting, I'm not putting it back in there, but I can slow down the drawing process, just covering it. Okay, and stuff. okay, and that'll um, do it. Yeah, okay. because I, it, again, we're working together. I know what to expect of it. I don't know how it behaves, so I'm working almost on that schedule. Okay. And, and, and if I need to cut down the process that's happened, if it's drying or something, then I just stop it. And I can leave it for a week at a time, you know, no problem. Come back to it, but I don't want to. I don't like to do that, even that, because then I break that mental, you know, uh, connection type of thing. This is the piece I was talking about. It actually has. It's kind of a squarish um, base and a squarish neck, and I did that on purpose because I made this to accept a square flower base, a glass. And that can be put in there uh, that would contain water because this is a flower base. Right. This right. contains flowers. And you add it, it and uh, this clay is actually porous. It, 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 it's not glazed or anything. So you have this effect that the Mexican oyas have. It, your water can go through and it can get cooled and stuff. But that's uh, good for functional pieces, but not for. Right. So it looks like um, this is not getting used as a base, but that was the whole purpose. And it was fun to play with because square is different than what I'm used to working with. So basically, if you look at this, you have the stems, you have a little bit of contour for the leaves, but then when you introduce the flowers, that gives the blossoms. <coughs>
Um, this is one of the first pieces that I started doing the the coil, the uh, nautilus shape, and um, but but you can see its beginnings from the an older piece that I was making, and these. This piece here is based on an old Anasazi uh, gourd-shaped uh, water vessel. And what I did was, I, instead of making one, I, I took two and combined them and gave it a little contour uh, on both sides. Also, it's the first time I ever tried to fire black outdoors in the traditional way, uh, if you've seen black pottery um, from down in the southwest area. And I didn't... Uh, have the experience of firing like that, but this was the first, my first attempt, and I lost the uh, maybe a dime-sized piece off of there on the bottom. And if that anything, <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous, but when things like that happen, the place, the thing is just tossed. You know, you might as well write it off or stick it up on your shelf or, or do something. You know, somebody comes along, family wants it, you give it away or whatever. But uh, so, so. Uh, anyway, so what I did was I loved the shape, I loved the idea, and I thought to myself, this is a waste, and that's what I did was I had it cast in bronze. So that's a uh, metal casting of it right over here with a black patina. And you can see that by making the mold in the way that they did back in those days, or the people that I used, that they, they broke this pot to, to make, be able to make their mold, uh, and it's glued back together. And this is the piece I was telling you about that is functional. You can pour out of it. You can make your tea in there if you like and pour your tea out of there. So this pot did serve as the mold for the bronze? Um, no. No. Um, they, well, they, no, they made, they made the, they cast the mold from this from that. to yeah. make that. Yeah. Is, was, that the, was that the same thing? <laughs> I think so. Okay. Sort of. Was there any, uh, Uh, the wedding no. face pots no. that have no. been done and other... No, not at all. This, to me, when I look at this, it, it reminds me, and you can see the name, it's a double rainbird. Now the rainbird is, um, you see it on the, all, a lot of the southwestern pottery, uh, on the Zunis especially, um, and where you have the beak. So to me it's like a, a parrot, parody type of thing, parrot type of bird thing. With, with the eyes, the heads, or the eye looking up skyward. Of course, the water comes from the, from the clouds, right? Um, also, the uh, funny thing about this is that I took it when I was like, oh, I can play with this. I'm going to stick some flowers in this. Well, I didn't realize that I have a wall coming. <laughs> well, like an inch and a half below that, and I tried to stick some flowers in there, and it wouldn't work. But my brain doesn't pick up that type of thing quickly. Uh, and and uh, so I think that's why I have to really sketch, make models, because a lot of my pieces, um, I can't visualize it. I can see it, but, but I cannot do even a 3D sketch of it, because it requires seeing the back side or the other couple sides. But it helps. It's just another way I manage. Um, I went into town and I, I had a bigger studio space and I started doing a little bit larger pieces. And these two pieces were uh, created in a, in a, in a, in a downtown uh, studio. And at that point in time, um, I, I think, I don't know what happened to me, but I just started thinking much different uh, pieces than I than I did before. But uh, if you have any questions on these, or you know, I'll just ask because it's just to me they're just. Well, now does this tell me the spikes? Is it, are they hollow the way all the other ones were? Uh, they're hollow, yes. You find from everything. the bottom coming up, and each one is hollow. Oh, everything. The and there's nothing solid or thick in there. And so it's built walls. from the shoulders out, the round head. Yes, and the top. Yeah. exactly. Okay. There's an inner globe that hold that the horns come off of, and then there's the outer 
wall that forms the outer globe. And, and as I was working on this, on this section of it, I have to build around, get it to another level, and then go again with my coils, and then get up there, and I had to, I had to build around again, and then finish that little tip. Do you work in silence, or do you have music, or anything? Like that depends. I, I, I have a lot of, I have a variety of different, sometimes I get tired of noise, and I want peace, you know, peace and quiet. Sometimes I like loud music, sometimes I like classical, so I've got the full range. Which is nice to have people who have choices <laughs> in anything, really. They don't have any choices. It's not fun. And I plastered it on with the, or uh, adhered it with the, with the, the pitch, fine pitch. After I uh, boiled it down and processed it, processed it, all I had to do was remelt it right onto the, the clay and whatever I put on it sticks. And um, that was a lot of fun, but I, anything I can um, do, which is a natural, um, which is natural and just comes to me naturally, I start playing with those and introducing them if it makes sense into my, my work. This is the sip that you it's using slip for texture, you just, you just don't beat it up until it's real smooth? Um, I know, you, it, whether it's thin or thick, I usually get it smooth. Oh, consistency. Where is texture? Oh, you mean like this, mm -hmm. like here? Um, it's just the thick. The thick slip. Yeah, and then um, kind of blot it on. Uh -huh. And I can get it as fine as I want, or I can, I can get it really thin with it. Where do you think you're going next? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting to see, and I'm excited about the prospect. You know. Do you have favorite piece of work? Always? Yes. No, I don't. No, because every piece is, is, is favorite in the time that I'm working with it. So they all go through the same, affect me the same way. Yeah. So that we can watch where you go next. Um, I don't have a website. I used to have one years ago, and I've been looked at it for years and years, and I haven't maintained it or anything. Um, I what maybe stay connected with the, the actual show because uh, some of these pieces are borrowed and have to be returned. Uh, and so I have to replace a piece. So it's going to keep me busy and working. So, and um, so if one piece leaves, and I replace it with another one. Um, so maybe um, again through the through the exhibit, uh, the website for this. Uh, I know it's going to Houston next. You know, and then Santa. Well, it'll eventually be in Santa Fe. It's going to go to Tucson. It's going to the Navajo Nation Museum, which is exciting to me because that's like my home base. Um, it's, it's eventually gonna uh, end up in Washington and the Smithsonian. Um, so there's, there's so, it's just, for the next three, four years, it's gonna keep me busy, real, very busy. And I don't know how much more time I have to give it, but I'm just gonna go, go with it. You should go to the Victoria Mountain. Um, January. January. Yes, January. Demonstration video. Um, I've seen you on YouTube. There have right? been uh, videos. Uh, people come to my studio. I don't pay a lot of attention to why. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's just that I'm more interested in doing my work, not promotion or anything like that. But yes, there uh, in Santa Fe at one point in time, we we did a um, we were a friend of mine. And I, we both, we both worked with my Cassius Pottery. What we were doing was uh, uh, producing a little show called the Micah Market, and um, that lasted maybe ran for maybe six years until we decided, you know, we were taking too much time uh, of our time away from the studio. So uh, we let, tried to let someone else handle it and run it, but it eventually just died away. But um, but we did produce a video. Well, during that time, and, and it was fun. I was maybe 15 years younger or something, but um, <laughs> yeah, there are a few videos out there. So. 
produced by maybe, like the one in Can the show in Kansas City, they had a video running at, at the same time as the, the exhibit was up. And you can see that online. Okay. Yeah, there are a few videos out there. 